<laughs> right, that's lovely. All right. Well, as if you don't know, my name is Edgar Allan Poe. I have been invited here by Franklin County Historical Society, so I'd like to extend my thanks to them and to all of you for having me this afternoon. Now, if you don't know, I had a father named David and a mother named Eliza. They were actors, and I suffer from something that my father did, terrible stage fright. <laughs> so, I brought some notes this afternoon so that I did, oh, here they are, so I didn't forget what I intended to say. Now, you could not ask for a lovelier day in the month of October, but if you know me, you know that I don't necessarily write on lovely things. How many of you know most of my stories? Any of them? All right, um, what are your favorites? Telltale Heart. Okay. Castle that's, Castle. Yes, Castle. That's, a, that's a wonderful one. I love that one. My personal favorite is Fall of the House of Usher. I believe that was one of my greatest. Of course, my greatest work does not actually lie in uh, stories or poems. I believe mine was Eureka. It's a, kind of a theory of the universe, if you will. Give it a, give it a read sometime. So anyway. <clears throat> oh. All right, see if I can read my own handwriting here. <laughs> All right, so this is my first time in Chambersburg. I've never actually been here before, but it is way nicer than I expected. For example, my, my original reputation of the city was a bit marred by a man named Franklin G. May, editor and publisher of the Chambersburg Times in 1845. Now, if you don't know, I wrote The Raven in January of 1845, and I gained overnight fame practically instantly. It was, it was a wonderful thing. But of course, everyone wanted a piece of my work. I was putting pen to paper faster than the presses could print my poems. That's alliteration. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was appreciated. All right. But the problem was I couldn't keep up with everything going on around me. I was keeping my eye on local papers to see where my name would pop up here and there and different poems and stuff, and it, it would bring me a rush of pride and joy, and it was wonderful. Except once, in the Chambersburg Times, Franklin G. May published an entire page of the Broadway Journal on the front page of the Chambersburg Times, and did not give me any kind of credit at all. So I, I wrote an editorial. Here's a, a snippet that I wrote. It's wonderful. <clears throat> the Chambersburg Times does us the honor to make up the whole of its first page from a single number of the Broadway Journal. This would be all very well had it not forgotten to give us credit for our articles contributed and editorial. And had it not forgotten not to make certain improvements to, an our, to our compositions to suit its own fancy. Copying, for example, a little poem of ours called Lenore, the Chambersburg editor alters the damned earth into the cursed earth. <laughs> now we prefer it damned and we'll have it so. <laughs> it changed my poem. That's like drawing a mustache on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Was I being petty? Yes. No. no. <laughs> Thank you. That's much more credit than I deserve. <laughs> well, anyway. They gave no apology, but they did continue to print Broadway Journal material into the Chambersburg Times, and they gave a version, or they gave us a review, sorry, of being not behind any literary periodical in the land. So, now here I am, a famous author, and I've only talked about the city of Chambersburg, which you all know very well. Perhaps you'd like to know a little bit more about myself and my life. So, I will indulge you. <coughs> my father, yes, the actor, suffered from stage fright and alcoholism and opioids, all three things that I would suffer from. <laughs> Great. <laughs> my father left my mother when I was three years old, left her with three children, my brother William, my sister Rosalie, and myself. I was left alone without a father, and we were all kind of split off and went to different places. I was taken in by the Allen family, John and Francis Allen. John Allen did not like me very much, and as I grew older, that became more and more of a problem. I went to the University of Virginia, recently established, and I did not have the funds to be there. And so I tried gambling. My my new father's money. <laughs> I lost 2,000 of his dollars, and he did not like that very much. I ended up leaving the University of Virginia and decided to try and earn his favor back by serving our country. I attended West Point Academy, where uh, on a break I went home and had another massive argument with Mr. Allen, and eventually uh, he gave up all well, hope for me. I was a disappointment to the family. Wonderful. <laughs> so, um, during my time in the army, I published Tamerlane and Other Poems, my very first pamphlet. It wasn't really a book, but it was my first thing I ever published. It did not win him any favor, and eventually, when I realized that going to West Point wouldn't make him any happier, I got myself kicked out. <laughs> I just didn't attend chapels. It wasn't anything terrible. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? Oh, that was, by the way, that was about 1927 when I published uh, Tamerlane and other poems. I don't know if any of you have read that. It's, again, quite good. 
I'm not very humble, am I? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Everything really interesting in my life happened after West Point Academy. I moved to Baltimore, where I gained this wonderful accent, with uh, my Aunt Maria Clem. I called her Muddy. We all have weird pet names for our, for our family members. I lived with uh, her and her daughter, Virginia, my cousin. It was 1836. It was not uncommon to marry family members, so when I fell in love with my cousin, Virginia, she was... 13 years old, I was 27. Back then it wasn't weird. <laughs> it was not weird to marry young people. Well, it might have been a little weird, but it was okay. We fell in love, we were married, and it wasn't necessarily a romantic relationship. This is something that uh, not many people know about Edgar Allan Poe, probably myself, of course. Not many people know this because after my life, a man named Rufus Griswold published my biography, and he, it was basically a slander campaign, talked about my alcoholism, opioids, uh, suicide, which, what? Anyway, I'm here, right? <laughs> Weird man. Um, so, not many people know this about me. I was not necessarily romantically attached to people. Um, a lot of people, psychologists, tend to think that I had a problem with my mother not being around because, as I did not mention, she died at the age of 24 from tuberculosis when I was uh, three. That's why I went to live with the Allen family. So when I had Virginia, it was almost like an attempt to connect with a female that was a motherly type figure. Even though she was that much younger than me, there was still, she was very sweet, she was very kind. It was a motherly kind of thing. I did not share my chambers with her for two years after we were married. So, I uh, just, it was more of a, a lot of people seem to think it was a sibling type relationship, but back then it was a totally different culture. So, um, sorry, got confused here. <laughs> oh yes, and of course, um, I loved her very deeply. We, I worked odd jobs, that was it, editing and publishing and writing uh, different, different editorials and things and reviews and getting into the literary circles of America where I met people like Rufus Griswold who wrote my biography and um, Elizabeth Ellett, Francis Osgood, I don't know if you've heard of them, they're fabulous poets and wonderful women. Um, things became a little difficult in my life uh, around that time because that's when I found out that Virginia contracted tuberculosis, the same disease that had killed my mother. She was 19 at the time, and I remember very, very clearly we were having kind of a, a get-together with the literary circles, much like this, a tea, and we were all together, and she, it was in my, my home, and she was playing the piano and singing. My Virginia was very talented, and uh, Griswold was there, and Ellet was there, and Osgood was there, and everyone was watching my wife play and sing. She wore a white gown that evening. I will never forget the terror that filled my heart, and the hearts of everyone there as blood came forth from her mouth and stained that white dress crimson. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that day my wife had tuberculosis. And I knew very, very shortly that there was, there was no hope for her and she was going to die. But she did not die quickly. It was a five year battle with tuberculosis. Five years. Every year or so it would, it would almost take a change. She would seem to get better and then it would just come back with a vengeance and take it down. She was bedridden for years. And, it was terrible, and that's probably what drove me further and further into the darkest parts that people know me for, is it was, wasn't just the fact that I lost her, it was the fact that, I, the fact that I lost her and then got her back, and then lost her again and got her back, and it shattered my, my already fragile mind into even smaller pieces. It was, it was terrible. But uh, finally, in 1847, she died. And um, I fell into what everyone knows me better for, my, my drunken ramblings and alcoholism and opioids and the terrible things that a man can fall into and the depression that you read so well in my poems it's kind of scary honestly to think that a man could be so dark that he could write those things but that's where I was and some of you may understand if you've ever lost someone you know it's not an easy thing to deal with so how I dealt with it was I wrote and that's what I did I tried to put my feelings down on paper and that's why you're all here today because you all have known about me through this and so I'd like to present to you all now my poem that you all know me for, The Raven. You all all indulge me. <laughs> Forgive me if I do get a little bit emotional. It's, that's why I wrote it, was to get my emotions down on paper. So, <sighs> once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak 
December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. To that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'or oh, madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I open wide the door, darkness there, nothing more. Deep into that darkness, peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Oh. <laughs> back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely, that is something at my window, Lattice. Let them see what entreat this is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance I wore. Though thy crest is shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. But we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting loudly on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before, when the bird said nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply, so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushion seat in front of bird and bust and door, and then upon the velvet sinking, I took myself to think. Fancy under fancy, thinking what his ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight floated o'er, but whose velvet lining with the lamplight glowed o'er. It shall press. Uh, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkered on the floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind of nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, still if bird or devil, whether tempest sent or whether tempest tossed thee. Here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. <laughs> tell me truly, I implore, is there is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore. 
Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aiden it shall clasp a saint and maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word, our signs of parting, bird or friend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. <laughs> Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting. Still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome Ms. Ann Mullen. Thank her. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Give her a hand.